Hello and welcome to Leading at a Local Level, which is an MLG podcast uh, talking about issues related to leadership uh, in local churches, local organisations and local businesses. And so, John, it's great to have you with us again. How are you doing, John? Yeah, really well. Thanks, Tim. Great to be here again. Really excited about this series that we're in. So, yeah, how are you today? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you, John. Yeah, I'm good. We are recording this in the summer. Uh, so, of course, we uh, we said we would try not to, to date these, but it is quite warm at the moment. So we're all kind of slightly sweaty, aren't we, John? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Let's That's talk about Along the side, you're doing that kind of, you know, reducing yeah. the glare off my forehead. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. So uh, we're in the middle of a series uh, on leading diversity. And uh, one of the things that's just so obvious in our churches at the moment is just really the recognition that we are increasingly diverse churches. And we've got all different types of people, different perspectives, different backgrounds uh, coming into our church. And, and part of being uh, a good leader, whether you're leading in church or you're leading in a charity or you're leading in a business, is learning how to appreciate people who are not the same as us and to lead them well. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking about leading those that would identify as same-sex attracted, aren't we, John, which is a really interesting subject. It is, it is, yeah. And I think that's the question for us today is as, 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 as leaders, as those who are thinking about our churches in that way, what does it look like to be a church that welcomes people who are same-sex attracted? Um, and there are, there are lots of people who are same-sex attracted who I've spoken to who have found that church hasn't felt like a home for them they haven't actually mm. felt welcomed um perhaps it's because of a big focus on families on nuclear families perhaps there's even at the other end of the extreme spectrum there's even a culture of homophobia um mm. perhaps there's been stereotypes reinforced you know, this is what real men do and this is what real women do or don't do and so on and so yeah that's our question today is how can local churches uh, be places where people are welcome so this is a big topic it means touching on uh, singleness, which we're dealing with, obviously, in one of our other episodes, but marriage, identity, uh, gay conversion therapy. So just a small topic for us to deal with today. And therefore, I'm delighted it's not just you and I speaking about it and that we are going to be joined by uh, Andrew uh, Bunt, who is um, part of a church on the southeast coast. He is Emerging Generations Director um, at Living Out, uh, which is a fantastic organisation helping people, churches and society talk about faith and sexuality and he's written a, a, a small book last year people not pronouns looking at uh, the transgender experience and um he speaks widely and writes widely on these issues and so i think andrew is waiting in our green room um it'd be great to bring andrew in andrew welcome to the podcast great to see you today thank you it's really nice to be here fantastic and just before we came on we were all set up to go and you got window cleaners so how is that going is your window been clean been cleaned yet <laughs> Literally in front of me right now, just here, the window cleaner is cleaning my window. Yeah, so you may or may not be able to hear that. I don't know. Oh, fantastic. Now, you live a bit, bit too far because I need my windows clean. I can hardly see out of my window because it's a fairly, <laughs> fairly new, fairly, yeah, haven't had it cleaned yet. So, um, but you are too far away from me to do it. Tell us about, a bit about where you where you live, Andrew. So I'm in Bexhill, uh, southeast coast, a kind of a small seaside town in between the bigger towns of Hastings and Eastbourne, which many people know. Uh, people can ask what's better still like. The way I tend to put it in context of people is there's a saying which is half a joke and to be honest, half true that people move to Hastings and Eastbourne to retire and then to Bexhill to die. And so it is kind of the epitome of Southeast Retirementville. And so I'm a slight anomaly, to be honest, but it's a lovely, quiet, sunny seaside place to live. So I don't mind that. Yeah, great. So, but but I understand, Andrew, that you you don't um, you don't stay in <laughs> in Bexhill all the time. Tell us a bit about what your your work, what what life looks like for you day to day, week by week. Yeah, no. Sometimes I question whether I actually live in Bexhill, and so I think uh, the people around me do. I spend yeah, a lot of my uh, life travelling the country, doing different things. So my kind of working life, my ministry life, is split between a few things. I'm Emerging Generations Director at Living Out, so I have the particular responsibility for how do we help. Uh, or how do we engage with under 25s and those working with them uh, with that kind of Christian perspective on sexuality? That involves quite a lot of traveling. We run quite a lot of events, you know, a lot of youth festivals over the summer, different things like that. I'm also uh, part of um, a team who runs some training stuff in part of New Frontiers and New Ground, uh, one of the families within New Frontiers. That involves some traveling mostly to London. And I have a couple of days in my week where I do broader itinerant ministry, a lot of speaking and writing. That also involves quite a lot of traveling. So I do spend a lot of my life on trains and motorways. And being home is always quite a joy because of that. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, fantastic. Thanks. So, so Andrew, you're, I mean, obviously really experienced in speaking to church leaders and those in, you know, with responsibilities in the local church. And that's what we're really all about on this podcast. But it's not just that you've got some expertise in this area, but actually this has been a, a real life issue for you. And so it'd be a great just to hear a bit about your story. Um, yeah, just to tell us a bit about your story from you know when you were younger and sure. and why you're here, I guess, today talking to us about about this 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 topic about about real people. Yeah, so I grew up just along the coast in Hastings in the church that I'm still a part of. Went away for uni and stuff, but have come back. I became a Christian at quite a young age. I think like a lot of children who grew up in a church, kind of there are a few points I can remember in my life when I gave my life to Jesus. I guess if you grow up and know more of yourself as a kid, you give more of yourself to Him, and so. I think I first made a, a decision to follow Jesus about age five or something, but I have a very distinct memory as well, age nine at being at Stonely, which was a big kind of family Bible camp at the time and becoming a Christian then. And I kind of remember at that point in my life, looking down the timeline of how I thought life would go. And I thought that it was very obvious that I would get to my early twenties. I would get married. I would settle down with a decent job and have a few children. And that would be what kind of what life would be. Cause I kind of looked around me. That's what everyone seemed to do in the church around me. That's what, kind of seemed to be at least implied if not stated was the right thing to do kind of from the pulpit and such like I just thought obviously I'm a good Christian that's what's going to happen yeah. mm -hmm. and then I reached my early teen years and I began to realize that I'm same-sex attracted so as my romantic and sexual desires emerged they were consistently for guys not for girls and I think to be honest when that first happened I, I actually generally didn't realize what was going on in a sense I had a pretty sheltered Christian upbringing this is now just under 20 years ago. The world is a very different place at that point. And I don't think I really knew that some people are same-sex attracted or gay. And so I kind of didn't know what to do with it. I didn't tell anyone, though. I guess I was sufficiently uh, unsure or uncomfortable with it that I just didn't tell anyone. I just kind of plodded on for a few years hmm. until I got to the middle of my teenage years. When I guess by that point, I was more aware of what I was experiencing, uh, kind of the fact this was an experience some people have. And one day shared with a guy who was kind of mentoring me even that was kind of a funny thing it wasn't particularly planned it was quite a surprise to him and i think to me he just kind of said one day is there anything else you want to talk about or tell me and to my surprise i kind of took that opportunity mm -hmm. and i remember it was that point must have been 14 or 15 it was that point that it suddenly became for me this realization of oh hang on a minute i'm attracted to guys but i want to mm -hmm. faithfully follow jesus how do these two things go together and it was almost like telling someone, I guess, had made it very much more real for me. As so that mm. really started that journey of, okay, what does this mean? How do I kind of square this circle? How do I hold these two things together? And really, as the years went on, I kind of then processed that in two stages. And I'm so grateful I can kind of look back and see the hand of God of how he prepared things, took me through a journey to be able to wrestle with that and get to a place of thinking, no, okay, this is, I think, how I can faithfully follow Jesus in that. So the first stage was wrestling with, well, what does God actually think about this? What does Christian faithfulness look like? What does the Bible say? Which is a question I was already beginning to wrestle with, but then kind of was forced into a situation where I really had to. So my, my A-level RS studies, a whole half of our A-level was an in-depth study of Christianity and homosexuality. And I found myself in this class, I was the only boy, there are I think 12 girls, only one of whom was a Christian. I'm not sure what her view in it was. And the teacher was a really lovely guy who was going to go into the Catholic priesthood but he was gay and didn't feel he could live out the church's teaching and so he became a teacher and so mm. i found myself as the closeted gay guy evangelical christian in this classroom having to wrestle with what should i believe and then kind of defend that to this class wow. which was a kind of intense situation to be in but was really helpful because it kind of forced me to wrestle with what does the bible say why is it this do i believe this and it kind of actually gave me a really firm footing in not I believe what I've been taught I believe what the church has believed for 2,000 years that sex and marriage are reserved for relationships of one man and one woman united in marriage for life so, so that was kind of really helpful and I think at that point I was 17 I guess I was well I am quite a pragmatic person and I think I was just like oh okay so I'll be single that'll be fine I think I was just kind of a little bit naive and young just thought that's fine so I kind of went off um, to uni and stuff. And I guess in my early 20s was really the second stage of the journey, just of realizing actually that's not quite as simple and easy, as comfortable as I thought it would be. And beginning to, to realize so many of my friends were getting partners or maybe getting married because of my church friends were a few years older than me. And just beginning to realize actually this whole thing of being an adult who's single, this feels much more difficult than I, mm -hmm. I thought it would be. But actually in that season, 
God just was so good to me in, in bringing along really good friends and particularly actually for me it was families who took me in one family kind of were parents of my parents age and they had kids my age one were people my age with kids uh, with young kids and just began to experience actually the fact that I could um, experience love I could experience family and that singleness didn't have to be loneliness isolation a lack of intimacy all that kind of stuff so it was like actually this thing which had begun to feel quite implausible can I actually do this can this actually work became plausible actually there are, there are ways that God can provide for the kind of legitimate needs that he's given me and um yeah that we all have as humans and so really my my journey or the key part of my journey I feel is those two steps of wrestling with what God said but then helped me realize in a sense how do you live out and then a decade later I go I guess or just under a decade you know life's not always easy and straightforward as it isn't for any of us but those two things are the foundations really on which I'm seeking to faithfully live this out as a follower mm. of Jesus. Mm. Wow. Well, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, it's really, really great to, to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I wondered if you just give us a feel as to, in terms of numbers across the, across the UK, I don't know if you've got these off the top of your head, but what sort of numbers, because the of people who are same-sex attracted, because in the media it can sometimes seem like it's every other mm. person, but what, what is the reality and what might that look like in a local church setting? Obviously, it will vary from place to place. But. Yeah. Yeah. No, see, I'm a words man, not a numbers man. So I never numbers. I mean, so the, <laughs> the, uh, the percentage of population who are, I think, it's LGBT, I think is what the um, um, figures are for, among the whole population is something, I think, around 1%, but do not quote me on that. But what I do know, what is really interesting is once you uh, narrow it down to kind of the 15 to 25 age bracket, at the moment is around 5%. That's the really significant thing actually to notice. Yeah. It's in a sense a really relatively uncommon experience among population broadly and among adults. But actually what we are seeing is this huge increase among um, teenagers in early 20s to the extent that it is now, I think, yeah, I think the latest figures, I think we're in America actually, was around um, five percent. There are ONS figures in the UK as well. So, but that does mean, you know, if if it is around one percent, which I think it is, that does mean if you've got a church of a hundred, you should expect there to be at least one person potentially who is mm. um, sexually attracted or maybe is wrestling with their gender. So it's not huge numbers, but actually also we should ref expect our churches or desire our churches to reflect the population. So it is something mm. I think all of us should be engaging with and wrestling with and there are also surprising stats again i can't give you numbers but i know they're there of the proportion of lgbt people who do come from a religious kind of upbringing of some sense that's the terms the research is used that could be quite broad so actually a disproportionate number of lgbt identifying people do in some way have some sort of religious background often christian and that's interesting for us as well, actually. So we should yeah. expect there's lots of people who know something of the gospel and of truth and might have had some sort of church involvement and might maybe want to come back when we find it difficult to do. I think that's mm -hmm. just also interesting and important for us to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, I certainly personally know two people, uh, well, a number of people I've walked with uh, who are same-sex attracted in the church. I, I know two of them have, walk, have walked away. Mm. Um but another three or four are, are, are still very much in church. And, so, and, and clearly mm. people, some people have found that a difficult place to be. Other people have found church a, a welcoming, a wonderful place to be. And I'm not sure perhaps either from your experience and or from, from, from others that you, you've heard from, what, what can be some of the challenges of walking into a church, mm. being same as attracted, mm. being gay, um, and... Being, being welcomed and being being part of that church what was what are some of the challenges yeah. that you've come across i think one initial challenge jess is for many people with experience attraction coming into a church just feels inherently daunting i think certainly historically and i think it is mainly historically not not solely christians have badly treated uh same mm. to people have totally misunderstood the experience have sometimes actually outright rejected and stuff uh, and, and sadly, Christians weren't the first to speak up against the bad treatment of LGBT people mm -hmm. as we should have been. And I think there understandably is in a sense a kind of a, a, an impact, a hangover from that. So there's just a sense of trepidation for a same-sex attracted mm -hmm. person coming to a church of, are these people just going to be deeply homophobic? And are they just going to reject me, hate me? And, and I think that's a very rare experience actually to happen now in a UK church. Mm -hmm. But I think we mustn't overlook kind of the impact that has had on people's expectations of the fear and also the fact that you know 
the media and certain campaigners and particularly Christian campaigners who want the church to change its position away from biblical teaching, Christian orthodoxy, kind of send this message of churches that don't affirm gay relationships are inherently dangerous for same-sex trans people. So, yeah. so, yeah. so a same-sex trans person coming to church is coming with all of this kind of expectation and, and baggage in a sense. And even that is a huge thing. So in a sense, even coming to the doors can be daunting. I think there are still sadly rare cases and they are rare i think i've only heard of you know very rare occasional anecdotal stories of people who have been badly treated in churches people who just even just been told they're not welcome or um just people are kind of almost i guess it is kind of fearful of them and often it's just kind of a people don't understand people haven't thought it through that's why conversations like this is so important that's why talking to our churches about this topic is so important because we want to create a welcome environment before people even get there in a sense to release. But then I guess there's just all manner of different things. Sometimes it's that church culture and what church is like can be quite uncomfortable for someone who's same-sex attracted. It's very easy for churches to kind of elevate marriage as the be all and end all, as being married and having kids as kind of a goal. As I said, that was kind of my, what I imbued as a child. And um, again, yeah. I think a lot of us are getting better in our church than that, but there can still be a lot of that. The reality is the vast majority of churches certainly the vast majority of church leaders are married people with kids and even mm -hmm. that can be isolating there's a sense of that's not my life experience mm -hmm. where do i kind of fit in here i mean i guess just one other is kind of people wrestling with well what what does following jesus look like for me and what's kind of the the cost of that and actually maybe someone's coming really uncertain of what the bible says uncertain even if they are a follower of jesus or want to be and they're wrestling with how does that fit with my sexuality and so mm -hmm. for some people the uh, the challenge of entering a church is just there might be a real interest in in exploring the claims of Jesus and an interest in faith, but a fear of what does this mean for me? And I think actually where church can be unhelpful in that in a sense is if we if we sense aren't all counting the cost of following Jesus. Actually, if we as churches are yeah. fairly uh, cost light in our gospel and our gospel kind of is just forgiveness of sins and God to make your life wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. But actually for a subset of people there's oh and also you've got to do this really difficult thing and actually sacrifice these desires and yeah. this stuff that just feels really unfair and really difficult and so yeah. actually often the as i kind of said to it, we the fact we are not always great at preaching the full gospel yeah. including repentance the cost of following jesus yeah. uh that i think can make church a very difficult context for someone who's same-sex attracted who does want to be faithful to biblical teaching yeah mm -hmm. uh, that's really good Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, isn't it? I think, you yeah. know, that actually you know, the challenge is, are we preaching the whole gospel to everybody? Because mm -hmm. um, the guy that runs his, his local business, you know, is he, is he submitting all his tax? Yeah. You know, yeah. actually for them, that's a significant issue, you know, and it's just the yeah. same. It's just as painful and just as difficult in some ways. Um, yeah. You know, if you haven't got a lot of money, you kind of think, oh, well, I'll just, you know, and as you say, preaching the whole gospel is important. Can I, can I ask a question? You travel a lot, obviously, you know, you, you talked about, um, and and would, how would you describe your uh, the average church leader? Because I, I suppose my my impression I work with quite a lot of church leaders, and I would say that the the biggest thing I would come across is just a, actually f they're afraid of the issue. If I'm honest, mm. right? Um, and not because they're afraid, you know, just in a sense of fearful, but almost afraid of saying the wrong thing, afraid of not un unsure about how to tackle it. They're just, and I suppose that's as, again as part of this whole series is trying to educate and, and just get their conversation going to remove the fear because you know, i suppose not a lot of church leaders have got a lot of experience in dealing with people coming in from that background and almost i think you know it's almost a, they're uncertain about how they would even respond to that but would you say that's mm. fair or true or what you've experienced i think so i mean in some sense my you know my anecdotal observation of church leaders will be skewed by if they come to an event where i'm speaking they're probably starting from a certain position already so there is that to say mm. but yeah no i do think my, my observation and a sense of real encouragement is the vast majority of church leaders I uh, talk to and meet really want to love um, such minorities well, really want to welcome them to the church, really want to help them thrive and flourish following Jesus. But it is absolutely, there's a, a fear in the sense of um, a feeling ill-equipped, um, uh, yeah, a nervousness of unintentionally and uh, yeah, unintentionally hurting people or uh, saying the wrong thing whatever it might be so i think i see a lot of the heart is absolutely in the right place but a sense of people feeling inequipped yeah. so in part that's why something like living out the organization i work for exists so we want to help 
equip churches and, and we are very much an organization trying to equip churches to do the stuff in the local context rather than you know us doing the work in a sense we're about equipping people to be the kind of church families we're called to be to uh, be a good home for everyone but also the thing i want to say to church leaders is as much as i think there's a need for something like living out also we have these kind of mental barriers about sexuality and gender particularly mm-hmm. we think of them as these very potentially mysterious and certainly kind of complex and and you know, true controversial and emotive topics in their real life but we so often as leaders kind of switch off all our leadership and pastoral common sense and all the good wisdom that we have from all the day-to-day leading and pastoring we do and actually I often would say to pastors you are much more equipped to do all this than you think you are yeah. and in a sense just you know take a deep breath don't be freaked out by the sense the fact that this is an experience of gender or sexuality actually remember you are well equipped and the spirit of god is with you to equip you as well mm-hmm. and sometimes even for people my encouragement to them is you know do a do a mental exercise and imagine that this situation wasn't actually about its roots such race and gender but with something else which might be kind of vaguely parallel you'll probably find you'd feel pretty well equipped for that and so there's yeah. lots of skills and understanding and wisdom you can kind of transfer across so i want to say the both end of yes there's a there's a healthy sense of, as a leader, I want to learn, I want to understand, I want to get equipped, and I want to encourage people to do that. But also I want to say, you are also quite well equipped in lots of ways as well, and don't, in a sense, ignore all the resources you already have within yourself and from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, no, that's that's really good, Andrew. I completely agree with you, and it's a very common question, actually, that I get speaking on this. I know it is for you as well. When people say, what do I do when somebody who's yeah. seems as attracted walks into the church? Um, <laughs> Uh, and so what, what's your, when that question comes to you just what's your response and so what, what, what do i do when they arrive in the church um, that does tend to be when i say well have a think you know take take sexuality take the context imagine this is a a couple of people in a different situation what it might be because pretty much anyone who comes to your church probably christian or not is in some ways living out of faithfulness to jesus and so actually it's just a question of what does it mean for us as leaders uh, as pastors to help people step into faithfulness of Jesus. So, so what do we do? Say, yeah, say a, a gay couple come to the church, say they're maybe not Christians, but interested in the faith. What do we do? Well, we make sure they feel really welcomed. We befriend them. We make sure they know that they're so welcome to be part of our community, just as any person who's not yet following part of Jesus is part of our community. And there might well be things within that, which in a sense, they're not able to partaking. Bread and wine, say, for many places would be a, a kind of a, a line in the sand there, but actually we're showing we're not treating them differently because they're gay. They're like everyone else here who's not yet a follower of Jesus because we're a community of Jesus followers, mm. but we love having others come and be a part of us as well. Yeah. And then really it's trying to prioritize introducing them to Jesus. So yeah, the priority isn't sorting out their relationship or their sex life. The priority is introducing them to Jesus, sharing the good news of the gospel with them, inviting them to respond to him. Because in a sense, lifestyle change and living change is only going to come and is only purposeful in a sense if it's part of repentance and following Jesus and so to the extent of I sometimes encourage people you know if if someone comes to your church and says I'm in a gay relationship what do you think about that I think one interesting approach to try is well it doesn't really matter what we or what Jesus thinks about your relationship and your sexuality if you don't believe he is who he says he is he didn't rise from the dead so should we talk about Jesus and if you decide to follow him then definitely want to come back and talk about your sexuality as all of us have lots of things to think through then but it doesn't necessarily matter at the moment and because one of the things we want to do is get people out of this mindset of God and Christians hate gay people and they're obsessed with the gay thing and actually show no no we're obsessed with Jesus and we want yeah. you to know Jesus yeah. and Jesus wants to know you and for all of us Jesus coming into our life is a bit of the bombshell and changes everything and so with you as with anyone we'll hope you work through that afterwards but actually that's where we want to start and so really yes we want to invite them to follow Jesus and then it is helping them wrestle with that if they might decide to make that decision and I think that that's the language I'd use, helping people to wrestle with what does the Bible say, what does this mean for me, helping people to journey. So yeah. although there are, I think, clear biblical parameters and there's a, a role for us in leading and pastoring to teach and to lay down those, actually for someone coming in that context, say, there's a big journey to go of processing this, of understanding biblical teaching, of wrestling with that, of the, the kind of heart battle to do that, the grief there'll be over the loss of relationships, stuff like that. Is so actually to see ourselves as someone journeying or accompanying someone on a journey rather than as kind of, you know, a sergeant major giving the orders that they've got to obey is, I think, yeah. a healthy approach to do it, which does mean we have to be prepared for a bit more mess and a bit more 
grey areas yeah. because sound vocation takes time. My observation is in church circles like mine, which is quite charismatic, we we think of sanctification is kind of, you know, pray, wham, bam, Holy Spirit, done. And yeah. that's just not the biblical picture. The biblical picture is putting on, walking out. It's all kind of growth. It's all this kind of ongoing stuff. Yeah. And I think we've got to be prepared for the fact that sometimes this stuff's going to take time and we've got to be in it alongside people yeah. for the long run. Yeah. Absolutely. There's, a, there's an excellent book, which I read a few years ago, which is, I'm sure you've read, which is called Change of Affection um, by Beckett okay. Cook. Yeah, and I thought uh, just just to reiterate the point you're making, I think the, the thing I took away from that book was that that really people need an experience with Jesus. If you haven't met Jesus, why would you change your lifestyle? Yeah. Like the reason that you're choosing to live in the way you are, and the reason that I'm choosing to be a church pastor and not, you know, be working and earning a lot more money doing other things, is because of Jesus. <laughs> and so until you've encountered Jesus, it's it's like you're trying to live without the without the why isn't it you're yeah, trying to live yeah. on the what and the how but really if you haven't understood the why it's it's yeah. it's pointless and i think absolutely like you know that is our job is to introduce people to jesus and worry it mm. i suppose jesus was a lot less concerned about their mess he was concerned about their mess in a sense after they'd really encountered him yeah. rather than before and i think sometimes we we've almost because i suppose the media i guess have made such a big deal of this particular issue mm -hmm. it's trying to almost worry about dealing with someone's kind of essentially as you say not not being right with god if that's sense or, or living faithfully for jesus i, I love that expression yeah. by the way yeah. um and um uh you know we're trying to deal with that first before they meet with jesus and it's like mm. you know in a sense as you say just being a pastor and helping people meet with jesus is yeah. is basically the job isn't it and then yeah. what comes after that is, is as you say a walk like anybody else it's yeah. i mean i've personally just that explanation found it very very helpful yeah and yeah, thank absolutely. you Really and it's just because it's just getting the gospel that around, isn't it? We and I, I don't think sexuality is the only place we do this. We we mm. preach the gospel pretty well, we intellectually get the gospel, and yet so often our pastoral practice or instinct is sort yourself out, at least instinct to his heart. And what we need to help people move away from the instinct is if I get myself right, if I sort my life out, I can get close to Jesus and he'll love me. And of course, the yeah. gospel is you no know, get close to Jesus and experience his love, and that will help you sort your life out. And there's something in the human heart that we you know, it's too good to be true in a sense, but it is true. It's there's something in the human heart that pushes against that. And so one of the key roles of a leader and pastor is to keep reminding people the gospel sounds good, too good to be true, and yet it is true. And actually, even with all your mess and your muck and your sin, what Jesus most wants is not strive to get yourself sorted to come to him. Yep. It's come to him because he longs to help you get yourself sorted. And mm -hmm. just getting that in the right order and time again, you know, it's what he says all our corporate worship and stuff should be reaffirming time and time again of come to Jesus and count him, experience his loving acceptance from that is going to flow then faithfulness to him. Yeah, mm. yeah I, look, I would say if you're listening or watching this, it's probably a good point to go back and just listen to that again because it's really helpful, Andrew. I wonder if I could just change tack a little bit because I want to ask you a little bit about identity and about mm. intimacy. And because so many, particularly of our young people, um, are being told in our society that your identity comes from your sexual preferences and mm. you've been being told basically if you're you know you need to choose what you are and that can go for gender as well as for your your mm. you know your attraction to other people and you need to choose that and actually there's a particular there are particular wins if you like in our culture from identifying with with certain groups and so mm. in our again as church leaders we need to be thinking um, and recognizing that this is coming into our church that, that your sexual identity and this is just this is ages old isn't it it's centuries old stuff really it's not nothing really new but your identity comes from your sexual preferences and that defines who you are and then of course from that as well it says well actually sexual intimacy is the way of fulfilling being living a fulfilled life and that you can only live a fulfilled life if you're having sex if you're in a sexual romantic relationship and that is the the the, the, the worldview that people are bringing from you know culture mm. into the church and these these are young people in our youth groups this is those who are not in our youth groups who are kind of getting that view of the world from popular culture how this is a big question then how do we as, as <laughs> leaders teach into that how do we think about what it, what christian identity looks like what does intimacy look like in the church there you go andrew yeah well yeah i mean you're you're absolutely right those are two key things to on. I, I when i talk to youth leaders these days i say after the gospel the next things to talk about our identity and probably friendship actually in a sense actually i think they mm. uh, can think about intimacy and stuff yeah identity mm. so well, part of it is recognizing the good in both of those things and actually what's going on in our culture is we're all asking who am i 
and we're all saying I have a need for intimacy, both of which are well, a good question to ask and a true thing, a God-given need. And so we want to affirm the goodness, but then we want to help people, including young people, think about actually, are we answering the question rightly? Are we thinking about intimacy rightly? And so we all understandably, rightfully ask the question, who am I? My observation is we forget to ask the prior question of how do I find who I am? And so we're all asking, who am I? We're all functionally living with an answer to that. You can't live without a sense of identity. We're all living with it in some way. We don't first ask, well, how do I find that? And so I, I have found it helpful to encourage people in a sense to bring into the light what we all do instinctively or kind of unmask what's going on and to think critically about that. Um, my observation is there are two ways that happens in the world around us, mm -hmm. both of which some people would say one's old, one's new. I think both are happening simultaneously in many people. One is what I call the other's decided identity, where your sense of self is built on what you assume other people think of you. And so if you think people look at you and evaluate you as a really successful person or really intelligent person or attractive person, that gives you a good sense of self. Of course, they can go really wrong. They can. You can assume they think you're a freak or a failure or a weirdo or whatever. That can give you a really bad sense of self. And I think things like, you know, social media, all kinds of different things are playing into that sense of we're assessing ourselves or we assume other people think of us. And um, I would reckon one of the reasons for poor mental health among young people is in part that their sense of competition among each other and what people think of them. So there's that sense of identity. Yep. Yep. But also there's what I call I decide identity, which is what you particularly will mention, John. It's mm -hmm. I look inside of myself and my feelings and my desires, and that's my true self. That's really me. And it's I decide because I look inside of myself, I find my feelings and desires, only I can know who I am, and then I declare it to the world around me. And if that's who I am, then nothing outside matters. My body doesn't matter, uh, mm -hmm. what people say, my tradition, my religion, none of those things matters. What it matters is that I embrace who I am. And if that's who I really am, then mm -hmm. I'm going to find my best life by embracing that and expressing that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the narrative in our culture. That's, you see that, you know, in kind of the, you know, inspirational slogans you see on Instagram, you know, don't change who you are for anyone else, those kind of things. You hear it in song lyrics, you see it in your films. Uh, the quintessential example is Princess Elsa from Frozen. You know, she has these internal, this internal thing, these magical powers, and she starts off by suppressing those, and that's really bad because that brings an eternal winter to Arendelle. We're telling young people who you really are is inside, and if you suppress that, that's really bad news. But the film goes on, she embraces those powers, she lets them out, summer comes, open doors at the palace. She's the hero because she's ignored what everyone else said to her, which is suppress who you really are inside. And she's embraced it and everything works out really well. You know, yeah. Disney is the great philosopher of our day. Elsa is the great yeah. hero. And so let it go. The reason that's all, one of the reasons that's all such a phenomenon is it perfectly encapsulates what our society believes about identity. Yeah. Let it go. Let it out. She's letting out this swirling storm she finds inside. Yeah. She's no longer being the good girl that other people want her to be. She's embracing who she really is. So that's what our young people are being told. And we need to just help them think, though, does that work? Is that true? Because there are some really big problems with that. One problem is incredible pressure. And we're seeing this among young people. If only you can know who you are, because it's all based on what you find inside, that's incredible pressure. Young people are being told, you must find out who you are, and only you can do that, and you need that to live your best life. What pressure as a teenager? I'm going to miss out on my best life if I can't yeah. work out from this. You know, All of us have a mess of stuff inside, particularly as teenagers. What on earth or who on earth am I? And the reality is those desires often aren't clear. They change. Often we don't know what we're thinking, for, frankly. So there's huge pressure. But also the, the real problem with this and the real clincher is none of us really believe it. And so we all know there are some feelings, desires we might look inside and find, and none of us would say, yes, that's who you are, you do you, you be yourself, even sexual desires. And so it's just helping young people see this really isn't a good way of making identity, but there is a much better answer to the question, how do I find who I am? And that's God decides. And it's an answer that makes sense. If we're made by God, it kind of makes sense. We'd receive our identity from him. So actually, yeah. it's what does he say about us? And it's helping young people see actually we're invited to receive an identity, not that we achieve by getting people to think of us in a certain way, not that we discover within, but we receive as a gift. It's an identity based on what Christ has done. Therefore, it's not going to change your feelings yeah. and desires. They might change people's opinions. They might change. It's all based on what Jesus has done. And actually, you can receive this identity of being a child of God who is loved, who he sings songs over, he delights over, that can never change. It's all based on what Jesus has done. And that gives you a solid sense of self from which then to kind of take hold of your feelings, your desires, and to assess them, not to be controlled by them. And so yeah. you don't suppress them and ignore them to make people think well of you. And you yeah. don't indiscriminately embrace them 
but actually you get to go, okay, so I'm experiencing this desire. What do I do with that? I feel like it's going to make me really happy, but actually what does the Bible say about it? It kind of just frees us from captivity to desires to be able to healthily look at them and assess them. So with identity, I think just finding any way we can time and time again to affirm to young people that who they really are is who God says they are, not just what they feel inside. Yeah. And just briefly on the, the intimacy thing, I think you're right, that's so key as well. Yeah. The problem in our culture is we have uh, equated uh, love or sex and intimacy. And so we live mm-hmm. in a culture that cannot kind of conceive of intimacy um, without, or sorry, um, yeah, intimacy without sex, which is why things like bromances work. You know, um, mm-hmm. who is it? Uh, Louis Tomlinson and Harry Styles from One Direction. They're mm-hmm. seen as a bromance because they're such good mates that the fans yeah. kind of look on and say they can't just be friends. And so there's all these kind of ideas. Well, obviously, there's more going on because we see genuine love, especially yeah. between men in our culture, yeah. and we assume sex. Yeah. But actually, that's just not true because we all know something like family. When family's working rightly, it's genuine love, but without sex. We all know love can exist, intimacy can exist without sex. Yeah. And so yeah. it's kind of helping me to sever that and realize actually that your need for love is totally right and God-given and legitimate, but you don't need to be having sex for that. Yeah. And for me, actually, that was the breakthrough. Those years when I was wrestling with, can I do this? How do I live this out? My breakthrough moment really was realizing what I felt like I really wanted was to have a man I could sleep with. But when I realized, actually, what that was about was I wanted to love and to be loved. Mm-hmm. I said, well, oh, okay, God might be saying I can't sleep with a man, but he's not saying I can't love and be loved. Now, that's the bit I actually need. And experiencing mm-hmm. love in friendship in a church family was what suddenly made me realize, oh, this is plausible. God's not denying me anything that I need. Singleness can work because there is intimacy even without sex, even without marriage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. It is brilliant. Yeah. And I, I just, I mean, that really, uh, yeah, thanks for that explanation. It takes me back to your, your story, really, Andrew, right at the beginning, you were talking about how you were walking with somebody and you just in the context, it sounds like to me in the context of a, a friendship of, a, of where you were doing life together, where you talk about other things that you felt able to share something, which was actually very, obviously very personal and something you've been grappling with. And, and, and I, I must say the number of friends of mine who have got, some similarities to that where they said this is not just something they don't just walk into the church and announce hi everybody you know <laughs> i'm gay um how are you um it's something that comes comes through and is talked about in the mm. context of genuine friendships mm. um, and so I, I guess sort of thinking as we uh, if we think about your know, church leaders and what this looks like in, in a church to 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 love people well who have these pressures, and as we said, you know, the, the cost should be similar for all of them, but there are there are costs in our society of of seeking to live as a celibate, you know, lifestyle as, as, as a gay person because of the sheer pressure and criticism mm-hmm. you get from from secular people who think it's mm-hmm. harmful that you would, you know, deny yourself all these things. How how, do, how are we places which that love people well, that walk in friendship and intimacy that looks like mm-hmm. that? Yeah, yeah, it's so key. How do we, yeah, it's how do we be the church community that does make this plausible and help people yeah. walk a difficult path? Yeah. Various things, some of which you touched on, I guess, already. Part of it is having a culture where everyone's counting the cost of following Jesus. I think it's just, yeah. you know, difficult things always so much easier, aren't they, when you know you're not alone in the sense, actually. That's that's not why we count the cost, but actually, it's, yeah. actually, it's, we're a community, we should be a community of people, yeah, counting the cost, walking a difficult road of following Jesus as part of that. It is, I think the thing of getting friendship right and get a church family right is really key. I do think for, because it's such a human thing to want to love and be loved and, uh, you know, a God-given need, and that's there in Genesis 2, um, that is so often the issue for people really actually. And so often the, either identity, how could God ask me to know who I am, or intimacy, how can God deny me intimacy, really is the reasons people give up on biblical teaching. And so addressing mm-hmm. both of those is key. So I think it is being a church which really does value friendship. And, you know, my, my encouragement to leaders will always be to really think about and look into what does the Bible say about friendship? We think mm-hmm. a lot and talk a lot and teach a lot of our churches what the Bible says about marriage and very little about friendship. When in reality, marriage biblically is the optional um, relationship, you know, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's really clear, frankly, that singleness is better and why not consider staying single? Mm. Whereas John 15, Jesus, I think, shows friendship as a marker of faithfulness to him. John 15, Jesus talks about a friendship as this greatest example of love, greater love as no man this, that he laid out his life for his friends. And then he talks about abiding, abiding in him 
He says the proof of abiding in Jesus is keeping his commands. Well, the only command in John 15 is the command to love one another as he has loved us. So Jesus is saying, if you want to you know, demonstrate the proof that you are uh, abiding in me, you're a follower of me, is that you keep my command to love one another as I have loved you, i.e. Mm-hmm. deep love. And he's just defined friendship as a relationship of love. It seems to me that John 15 says that actually having deep, meaningful, loving, self-sacrificial friendship is a marker of being mm-hmm. a follower of Jesus. That's mm-hmm. the uh, sever- seriousness, in a sense, with which the Bible approaches friendship. So it's mm-hmm. casting a vision for that, literally just talking about it, raising the bar on that. I mean, you know, interesting question, how many sermons have you heard on friendship? Probably not very many. How many have mm-hmm. heard on marriage? Probably quite a lot. That's just interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a it's, fascinating it's, point, isn't it? It's, it's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I think we can talk about it, and also we want to uh, exemplify it. So we want to, particular leaders, again, lead by example. If you're a church leader and people think of you as yeah, a good, maybe a good family man with his wife and his kids, but they don't think of you as a good friend and they're not aware that you give time and effort into developing friendships and loving your friends and having deep, meaningful friendships and you're sharing life with people. If you as a leader are not doing that, why would anyone in your church do it? Since we, we show friendship is important by sharing that in our lives. I think that overlaps with the church family thing. I think what does it mean for church to be family? Partly it means that getting friendship right. But particularly, I think church family means doing the things of ordinary life, but doing them together. Because that's most of family life, isn't it? Family life isn't all the big special occasions, you know, uh, candelabras and best silver and stuff and three course dinner. It's just having pizza in front of Brian's Got Talent or whatever it is. It's doing the really normal mundane things, but doing it with other people. Yeah. And I think, so my experience is those kind of experiences are much more life-giving than, yeah, being treated like a special guest, say. So how do we just open our homes, open our families, open our weekly diaries and routines, in a sense, to do more of life together? So everyone gets to experience a sense of family, which brings with it a sense of intimacy. Yeah, that's great. That whole whole idea, isn't it, of community and friendship, I think is something that our society is really challenged, is finding very difficult. Um, I've got got three kids and, you know, by the time that you're just maintaining your own family life, um, you know, it's really difficult to make space Mm. for for other people in a sense um it is difficult and it's just tiresome and people who you know we're so busy and i think actually that is as you say a huge challenge um we're going to talk in another one of these podcasts we're talking about singleness um it's the same the same principle you know we, we as you say how many examples in i mean i've been this is something i've been trying to do in my preaching is when you give examples how many of your examples relate to being married yeah. um how many of them relate to what it's like to be single um you know what i mean and i think it's just something that that you know i've become increasingly aware we've got a number of friends that you know are single and it's a real as you say it's a real challenge to think about what friendship mm-hmm. friendship looks like and um yeah it, it's it's definitely i think leaders need help in that actually because i think leaders often i don't i don't know if you, you've you've noticed this i know that we john and i have talked about this i think i don't know if we talked about it on this podcast but but before but leaders struggle with friendships Mm-hmm. They just do. They they really do. And often the reason that leaders burn out, if you dig into it, one of the biggest issues that, that causes moral failure in leadership, mm-hmm. you know, exhaustion, burnout, leadership is a lack of friendship. Um, and so I just think your your what you're highlighting there is just a huge a huge issue, really. That as you say, they're almost like underpinning issues, aren't they? You know, yeah. it's yeah. like you know we jump immediately to this kind of the the hot button issues, but actually some of the other issues are like friendship. You know, teaching on intimacy and what sex is. Yeah. You know, those things are actually deeper, but in a sense, provide the culture and the foundation for for the rest of this kind of conversation and, and healthy kind of culture to build. I guess. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think actually, if you are a you know, church leader or youth leader, the same thing. If you want to engage well with the topics and experience of sexuality, you do want to occasionally talk about them, but you can do almost all of it, and it's better to do almost all of it by not talking about it at all. But talking yes. about identity, about intimacy, friendship, church, yeah. family, the cost of following Jesus, you know, you almost need to barely ever talk in sexuality. And particularly, I think that's helpful for youth leaders. Some youth leaders yeah. just feel actually, we've never talked about this. All the young people believe all this kind of secular stuff in a sense already. It's just not going to work if we come in with the sex talk or what the Bible says. Yeah. That might well be true, but you can do almost all of it well before talking about sexuality, start talking about identity, start talking about friendship, all that kind of stuff, you're preparing the ground. So then when you bring in a Christian view of sexuality, it doesn't seem so radical and wide, wild, because it joins all the dots in a sense of everything else you've already been talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I, I think we're probably pretty much out of time, actually. Um, I I just want just, just a reminder for those listening and watching that, you know, there's two things to say. One is that 
this uh, this area, like culturally, could, it can be a very challenging area. You know, we've got the gay conversion therapy ban sort of moving their way through parliaments and committees and 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 so on. There's there's lots going on there, and the, it can be very feel very easy to feel threatened, you know, and that we might be going to prison or something like that. And I think on the one hand, we need to be aware that you know it's it's going to be increasingly costly to hold a biblical sexual ethic. For church leaders, as well as those who are, are who are same sex attracted, but on the other hand, I think from really from what you just said uh, all the way through, really, Andrew, what a tremendous opportunity, both in terms of biblical teaching to address these key issues, um, at, but also just as a church community to be those places of friendship and intimacy and welcome mm. and, and genuine family that people are longing for. That actually the local church should be and can be the place where we find that and actually in a diverse setting of families of children of, you know, of every sort of sense of diversity this could be a wonderful place for people to find find the lord and to grow in their knowledge yeah. um, of the lord jesus so I, I think for me that's a sense i get from our conversation is that yeah this is this is challenging and there's some work for us to do but actually equally what a great opportunity uh, to live out the gospel and i'm i'm just i feel excited as in sort of someone in leadership and i hope that you know those listening to feel the same there's a, there's a sense of excitement and opportunity to to love mm. people well mm. so and, and some great resources from um as well from from andrew and the, the team at living out there's a brilliant um uh, church audit which we'll put the um uh, the link in the show notes but you just see there on the screen living out uh, dot org um but there's a yeah, great church audit which is um really sort of asking you some really incisive questions about how you're getting on as a church would recommend you do that um i mentioned uh andrew's book he's actually got another book that's coming out uh, as this is being released really it's called finding your best identity a short christian introduction to identity sexuality um and gender so yeah do do check that out where andrew unpacks uh, i think you do anyway andrew you unpack um all of these things and uh, and get into things a little bit more so yeah andrew thanks so much for for being with us today well pleasure enjoy yeah we've really appreciated you being with us um and so yeah so that's um in our episode uh looking at uh diversity in the church focusing on sexuality as part of our series on uh diversity in the church and we look forward to seeing you next time bye from all of us here today <laughs>